So we've been going through the seeds of corrupt religion um, for the past couple of weeks, and we want to go back to Judges 18 this morning and uh, continue to look at the Danites. Um, I forgot to look at my map. Some of you may have maps. I handed out maps last week. If you, um, if you do not have one, uh, there are probably a couple at the end of my row. Does anybody not have one that was, is anyone not here last week that I didn't get one to? All right. Um, there are some at the end of my bench there if you need one, and Jonas will be glad to, to get that to you. Um, but it, it lays out where the territory of Dan, we saw last week where Dan was supposed to be, according to the boundaries that God had established. Uh, we went back to the book of Joshua and saw that, and then also read some at the beginning of Judges and found out that the Danites did not take the land. They didn't possess the land that God had given to them. Uh, they didn't drive the Amorites out. And so we, we saw last week, and we'll read it again in verse number 1 here. It says, in, in those days there was no king in Israel. That's a, a reference to that which we read previously in chapter 17. In those days there was no king in Israel. And the implication there then is that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So we read that in chapter 17 and verse 6, and we see the same thing in verse 1 of chapter 18. And so as they were doing that which was right in their own eyes in those days, the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in. For unto that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. And we saw last week that it was their own fault, right? They didn't take the territory that God had given them. And so if you look at your map, you'll see that, that the, 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 the portion that had been given to Dan was toward the southern end of Israel. It was down below Ephraim, which is where uh, Micah is that we were looking at in chapter 17 there. So that, that territory was just below Ephraim, uh, near the southern end. But Dan is now going to travel all the way up to the northernmost tip of Israel. And they're going to they're gonna take this city and, and call it after themselves. And so uh, that's what we're finding out about here in chapter number 18. We're seeing how it was that this city named Dan, came to be so far away from the territory that God had given to the Danites. And so we've looked at some seeds of corrupt religion in this text, and we've seen uh, that convenience is a seed of corrupt religion, uh, a desire for comfort is a seed of corrupt religion. Also, we saw uh, the, uh, those that would list their credentials as, as uh, Micah did. Here's my list of things, and so God has to bless it because I've got a Levite for a priest. That that's a seed of corrupt religion. And then last week we saw that a religion of choice also leads to corrupt religion. A religion that emphasizes choice. Our right to do as we will. And that's exactly what the Danites did. They broke outside the boundaries that God had established and said, we know the best thing to do. We're going to go our own way. And they go way up to the north end there to, to establish their own city and, and to make a name for themselves. And, and we, need to, that, we need to be aware of that in our day and age because we have our, you know, have it your way culture in our day. Whatever you want, right? Whatever floats your boat, whatever, whatever you desire, it's your choice to do as you will. And, and that was the mentality of the Danites here, this, this kind of buffet approach to the word of God, right? I can pick and choose the things that, uh, that sit well with me, and so I'll observe that, but this part over here, not so much. We need, the, uh, we need, like Paul said he did to the Ephesians in Acts 20, I think it is. He says, I haven't ceased since I've been among you to give you the whole counsel of God. We need the whole counsel of God. Amen? And, 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 and that's what we've endeavored to do, and I pray we will always endeavor to do here in this church, is to uh, not pick and choose the things that are most comfortable to us, but that we would consider the entire counsel of God. That we would have that balanced approach to God and, 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 find, and not lean uh, too far one way or the other, but that we would uh, see him for all that he is. So um, uh, just, uh, just a quick note. I wanted to read this. You don't have to turn there for time's sake. But Brother Gene read this last week, and I thought this is what the Danites should have done. This is in 1 Corinthians 15 and 57. It says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. God said, Dan, I've given you this land. Go in and take it. So tell me this, if that's what God said, with whom there is no lack of ability, were they then able to take it? If God said, I've given it to you, it's yours, right? 
Go in and take it in the, the, this first verse, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is true, but we have a responsibility in that. The next verse says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So we have the victory in Jesus Christ, but we've got to believe that, right? And we've got to walk in that victory. We've got to be steadfast and immovable, and we've got to be abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that that labor is never in vain, even when it looks like it is. Even when you're Noah, preacher of righteousness for all those decades... And nobody gets on the boat but your family. The, our labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's what the tribe of Dan should have done. But when choice is emphasized, man will always choose the easier path, even if it means disobeying God. And so we said last week, it's not choice that we need to emphasize, but it's conformity. It's conformity to the will of God. It's conformity to the person of Jesus Christ. We are to be conformed to his image. Obedience to God in the pattern of Christ. Those are the people that will enter the kingdom. How is the kingdom of heaven taken? You guys remember that? By force. That suggests some pretty serious activity, right? The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it. By force. We don't enter in skipping along. We don't need armor for that, right? It's not the easy path. We're supposed to put on the whole armor of God. That means we need to be prepared for what? Warfare. The Danites chose the easier path, which was contrary to that which God had directed them to do. So let's keep reading in this in verse number two. And the children of Dan sent of their family five men from their coast, men of valor, from Zorah and from Eshtaol, to spy out the land and to search it. And they said to them, Go search the land, who when they came to Mount Ephraim, that's where Micah was and his, his Levite priest and his idols, they came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah. They lodged there. When, when they were by the house of Micah, they knew the voice of the young man, the Levite, and they turned in thither and said unto him, Who brought thee hither? And, uh, and what makest thou in this place? And what hast thou here? And uh, when, you, when you read this and, and looking at what some of the commentators had to say about this, it wasn't necessarily that they actually knew this guy, but the, the point here may have been simply that they recognized that by, by hearing him speak, you're not from around these parts, are you? Do you guys remember where the Levite was before he came to Micah? Anybody remember? He was in Bethlehem of Judah. Now Israel was called the northern kingdom and Judah was called the southern kingdom. So this priest was a good old southern boy, right? And so the, the, the particular dialect or accent uh, made it clear that he wasn't from the mountains of, of Ephraim. And so um, they, they recognized that and they wanted to know his story and how did you get here? In verse number four, and he said unto them, thus and thus dealeth Micah with me and hath hired me and I am his priest. I think that I find that to be very interesting language. He has hired me. Not God has called me. Micah has hired me. In other words, and we're going to see this, therefore he will go to the highest bidder. Jesus talks about the shepherd of the sheep in John 10, and then he talks about a hireling. You guys remember that? And what is it that a hireling do doesn't do? He doesn't care for the sheep. Who's the hireling concerned about? Himself, right? The wolf comes and he runs away because I don't want to get eaten by the wolf. He doesn't care what happens to the sheep. This, this guy was a priest for hire. And so, um, reading on, it says, And they said unto him, Ask counsel, we pray thee of God, that we may know whether our way which we go shall be prosperous. And the priest said unto them, Go in peace, before the Lord is your way wherein ye go. Now, did anybody else notice there was something missing between verse 5 and verse 6 there? Before he responds, 
They, they said, um, ask counsel, ask counsel of God, uh, we pray thee of God, that we may know whether our way which we go shall pros be prosperous. And I'm expecting there to be a verse that says that the priest went before the Lord and sought the Lord's will in the matter and he comes, no, he's not seeking the Lord, right? He doesn't care what God says. You know what this guy's interested in? He's in interested in telling them what they want to hear. He immediately responds, go in peace before the Lord is your way wherein ye go. The general idea is, is, is that he's not going to rock the boat, right? Uh, it, it, verse, uh, uh, one of the, a footnote in one of my Bibles says that verse 6 literally can be read, the Lord is before the way in which you go. In other words, you're walking in God's will. Go ahead. Go for it. Do it. Do what you want to do. He's pleased with your direction, so go for it. And so this is what I want to highlight in this particular text here. We see here a religion of compliance. There's our next C, right? All of our things have started with C, these seeds of religion. We see a religion of compliance. And a religion of compliance is a seed of corrupt religion. Don't rock the boat. Don't rock the boat. He tells them what they want to hear. After all, we ought to all get along, right? I mean, that's biblical. You see the serpent's tactics in that? You see how Satan, well, don't forget what Satan did when he tempted Jesus Christ. What did he quote to him? He quoted in the word of God. What did he do back at the very beginning when he tempted Adam and Eve? Hath God said he brought up the word of God to them. But then he twists the word of God. Even as he did with Christ, even as he did with Adam and Eve. And by the way, our, our, um, the way that we combat that is exactly how Christ did with Satan. Satan would quote one scripture and what would Christ do? He'd quote scripture back to him. It's also written this, right? You, gotta, you better compare scripture with scripture to get to the bottom of what the truth is. And so this guy, he tells them what to hear. And, you know, after all, we should all get along. That's the, the tactic of the serpent. And just hold your place and look at Ephesians chapter 4. Put your marker there in Judges 18. It'll probably, if we get back to it, it'll be a bit. But look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. I, th I think I've told you guys, I think of Nico every, in Greece every time I read forbearing there, because he says in the Greek it literally means putting up with one another in love. Endeavoring to keep the what? The unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So, so you say unity, that's a good thing, right? We ought to strive after unity. We ought to strive to be together and don't rock the boat. Unity, that's, that's biblical. But it doesn't just say unity. And I tried to cut Brother Al off, but he's too quick. And he read the rest of it, which we need to. It's not just unity all by itself. It's what, brother? The unity of the Spirit. Not just being together for the sake of being together, but being walking together in the spirit, right? In other words, there's still someone directing this thing. There's still someone that's guiding us in this unity. It's the unity of the spirit. And listen, the things that aren't of the spirit, we can't be united on that. This guy doesn't even ask God. That, that's what you want to do? You want to go up there? God be with you. He'll bless you in that. Go for it. We're all for you. He doesn't even seek the Lord in the matter. 
The church's call to unity is never understood to be at the expense of truth. Amen? Never at the expense of truth. We don't swallow down error and practice sin just to get along. Remember, Paul rebuked the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 5 over this very thing. He said, you've got a guy among you that's involved in such deplorable sin. He said, you don't even outside the church in the Gentile world, you don't even hear about this kind of sin going on. And you guys are just continuing week after week like it's no big deal. The guy's in adultery with his father's wife. You can't be united over that. You can't act like everything's okay. The church's call to unity is never understood to be at the expense of truth. This Levite is quick to comply. Like I said, there's not even a break, right? It's just like, inquire the Lord and, oh, I know exactly what God would say. Go for it. The Lord be with you. God will bless your efforts. He told them what they wanted to hear. He complies immediately, he agrees with their desire, and he never stops to ask God if it's okay. If he had, God would have said, no, go back to where I told you to be, right? God would have said, here's the boundaries that I established for you, Dan, go back there. But he doesn't care about that. He's just wanting to get along. He just wants to comply. A religion of compliance this guy wants to be everybody's friend and listen you cannot be everybody's friend at least they think you to be their friend and be faithful to the lord and be faithful to their souls everybody will not be happy with you matthew 15 You can't be everybody's friend. That is, make everybody pleased with you and be faithful to the Lord. Paul, when Peter stepped out of line, Peter, this is the apostle Peter. This, I mean, this is one of, the, one of the special three that the Lord would get along uh, with him and, and, and give them special revelation that he didn't give to the rest of the disciples. I mean, they were, he was with Jesus on the mount. And yet when Peter steps away into error, before the whole church and his his bad example leads other men astray Paul withstood Peter and he said I withstood him to the face before them all he didn't just comply to get along right when truth was at stake Paul withstood Peter to the face before them all What about Christ himself? Was Christ liked by everybody? (laughs) That's That's a silly question. Of course not. They crucified him. It's because he never. He never diminished the truth. He never watered down the truth. So that he might be accepted of men. He always spoke the truth. He always did those things that pleased his father. He rocked the boat, right? Jesus rocked the boat. He said the things that were just counter to all that they had swallowed down in that day and age. I mean, the religious elite, the ones that they were, the people were looking to for guidance that knew the word of God best, Jesus comes in there with a message that just opposes them at every point. He spoke the truth even if it wasn't popular. Matthew 15 and verse number 12. Jesus has gotten through talking to these Pharisees. Verse number 1, you know, they they had gotten on uh, to his disciples and wondered why it was that the disciples weren't following the tradition of the elders. And when Jesus is done talking, does he just kind of comply with them and do what's necessary to get along? Well, verse number 12 says, after he was done talking, then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? 
And Jesus said, oh, why, man, well, we don't want to be there a lack of unity. Let's go smooth that over. No, nope. he said, every plant which my heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Leave them alone. Let them alone. They were offended at the truth. Let them alone. They be blind, leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. He spoke the truth even when it rocked the boat. He didn't simply comply with error for the sake of unity. Did you know that Jesus could even call Judas friend and not be lying when he said it? You guys know he did that, right? Yeah. What did he say when Judas comes to betray him? Friend? Why are you come? What, wherefore didst I can't remember. Wherefore didst thou come? That sounds like King James Version, something like that, right? But he calls him friend. Was that true? Had Jesus been a friend to him? Faith, faithful are the what of a friend? Wounds. Of a friend. Do you remember that Jesus said to Judas, to Judas, he said, you know, the one that betrays the Son of Man, it would be better for that man to never have been born. Wow. That's pretty friendly. Before the betrayal takes place, for Christ to say in the ears of this man, it would be better to have never been born than to do the thing that you're thinking about doing, Judas. That's a faithful friend wounding, right? Jesus called him friend. A true friend will disagree with you and tell you the truth even if it hurts your feelings, right? Even if it upsets you. That's a true friend. What does an enemy do? What does that same verse say an enemy does? The kisses of an enemy are deceitful. I was, Lori, I wasn't blowing anybody kisses. Okay, those were all directed to you, baby. An enemy kisses. They everything's okay and they want to get along, but a friend, and they're holding the knife behind their back. But a friend will tell you the truth. They'll disagree with you even when it, it hurts, it upsets you, but it was needful. An enemy tells you what. You want to hear. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Here's what an enemy will do. He will satisfy your itching ears. You remember that? In 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. In verse number 3 says that. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. The day's coming like this, the Lord said. He, he warned his disciples that uh, uh, through the apostle Paul here, he's warning Timothy, the time's coming that they're not going to hear this sound doctrine anymore and they've got this religious itch that they won't scratch, but they, they don't want you to tell them the truth. They just want to satisfy that religious itch and they're going to gather teachers to themselves that will do that. That will, that will handle kind of the surface level things, but they won't get very deep because they don't want to rock the boat. Because they don't want to tell them what they need to hear. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. We're here in America, right? This is our day. Is this relevant to our day? Absolutely. Because we've got people in pulpits that they won't tell the people what they need to hear but they'll tell them what they want to hear. And they'll do it in the name of Jesus Christ. And they'll satisfy that religious itch. And they're not giving them truth. They're giving them fables. What we need to do in contrast to that, verse number two, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Not all of those things in the latter part of that verse are comfortable, right? Rebukes are uncomfortable. Verse number five, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, because they're not going to like that. But you do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Tell men the truth. Give them the word of God. We don't need men who, who will comply 
in such a time. We need men who care, who, who truly care for souls enough to give them the truth. Ezekiel 13, we're about out of time. I, want, I don't want to miss this, though. Ezekiel chapter 13. Listen to what God had to say about the prophets here. In Ezekiel's day, found the same prophets in, in Jeremiah's day. In fact, Ezekiel was a contemporary of Jeremiah. One's in exile, one's in Jerusalem. And the word of the Lord came unto me in verse number 1, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. Not from what I said. You made this up. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit in contrast to whose spirit? God's, right? We need the unity of the what? Of the who? Of the spirit. They followed their own spirit and they have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. You haven't done the hard things, right? You've just complied and you've given them what they wanted to hear. You haven't spoken to them the truth. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. They said these things hoping it would be so, kind of like this guy, this priest. He told them what he wanted to hear, and he's thinking, man, I hope this works out. <laughs> but I don't want to rock the boat, so I'm going to tell them, you go ahead and do what you want to do. God's with you. Have you not seen a vain vision? And have you not spoken a lie in divination? Whereas ye say, The Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. And mine hand shall be upon the prophets and see vanity, uh, that see vanity that, and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel, neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord God. Because, even because they have seduced my people, saying peace. What did he tell them? Peace. God's with you. Do what you want to do. These lying prophets said peace, and there was no peace. They told the people what they wanted to hear. Nebuchadnezzar's not going to come in and destroy Jerusalem. God's going to take, you're God's chosen people. God's going to take care of you. Jeremiah's over there saying, submit to Nebuchadnezzar because God's delivered us into his hand. But these were saying peace when there was no peace. And one built up a wall and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. So verse number 17 there weren't just these men that were prophesying. There were women among them as well. Likewise, thou son of men, set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart, and prophesy thou against them. And what was the description of these individuals in verse number 22? Because with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthened the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. That's an individual that doesn't care for souls. He simply complies with souls. We need to care for souls. We need to care enough for souls to give them the truth, even when they don't want to hear it even when it's contrary to what they think and what they desire to hear. A religion of compliance plants seeds of corrupt religion. And this guy just wanted to...